Hello, subscribers and YouTube followers. We're so glad you found the Life Lessons Publishing Channel and hope it's a blessing to you. The sermons we provide on our channel were recorded while I was the senior pastor of Northwest Church in Federal Way, Washington. And our hope is that you'll grow as a disciple as you listen and watch. However, I want to tell you about another resource we have for you, our books. As a nonprofit organization, we give away our books at no charge to anyone who wants them. This isn't a gimmick or a way to get your email address. We're simply trying to fulfill the calling God has for us to equip the saints by providing solid Bible study materials for pastors, leaders, and, and you, the hungry Christian who wants to grow in your walk with God. If you're interested in receiving whichever one of these books, please email us at info, I-N-F-O, at lifelessonspublishing.com, and we'll send you a book. We won't keep your email address or try to contact you later. Our heart is for you, the committed believer, to step out in the calling God has on your life. And you need to know his word well in order to do that. Now, here's our latest video. May God bless you as you watch it. Take out your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 25. I'm going to talk today about the Ark of the Covenant. Of course, everybody has seen the Raiders of the Lost Ark, so you all know a lot about it already. It's just a bit different than that. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come now and open our understanding. We cannot understand the things of God without your revelation. Our natural minds do not see spiritual truth. But Lord, you can give us eyes to see and ears to hear. You can, and we can incline our hearts to be soft earth and receive that which is from you. Come now and minister to every one of us. Strengthen us. Build us up, Lord. Help us walk firmly in the knowledge of God, rightly founded on a rock. And I ask for the grace to speak your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I start, let me just say this. Um, there's nothing more important to any one of us than our understanding of God. Uh, who we believe God to be affects who we become personally. Uh, nothing molds you like your understanding of God. It's how you live life, what you value, everything else. When people try to envision God with their natural minds, when normal people try earnestly to, to decide what God is like, they inevitably create a monster. Because without the Lord revealing himself to us, all we can do is pretty much extrapolate, make larger uh, what we know of life and of each other. And so we create a God who's really a big human uh, with particular aspects. Think of, think of what the Romans and the Greeks did when they created gods. They were liars, they were thieves, they raped, they, uh, they killed each other, they uh, you know, had incest. I mean, it was just a disgusting romp going on in some celestial realm, and occasionally they'd come down and trouble the humans. And then you, you think uh, of... The animistic religions where you have uh, angry, life-denying, cruel gods that you have to sacrifice things to. And, and if you don't, they're going to give you a bad harvest or kill your firstborn or whatever. And so you're running fearful with these horrific gods, you know, that are out there. Uh, never know what they'll do next. And, and uh, many, many parts of the world even today are under that oppressive uh, religion of animism. This is what the human mind has invented as God. In some cases, they give human sacrifices. That kind of stuff still goes on, by the way. Or you go to the to Europe and and uh, the the religious philosophers in France and Germany and places like that, and they come up with a God who is distant. Uh, if he exists at all, uh, he made this universe, kind of wound it up like a clock, and sent it out to do whatever it does. He's way too busy with himself or whatever he does to worry about us. He certainly doesn't know you. I mean, if you exist, he may have an idea that there's something growing on that one little planet down there, but uh, he's dispassionate. He's disinterested. Uh, he's, he's not there. Uh, we can certainly thank the philosophers for that. Or we can have the American God because the Americans also invented a God. Theirs is quite money interested and he will help you for a thousand dollar love gift. Um, 
he is, he is a God who used to be angry and judge sin, but he has, uh, he has, he has uh, gone through therapy, and he has, he has realized that he was acting out some of his frustrations over Adam and Eve, and that uh, he now is, uh, he was codependent and unhealthy, but now he's had therapy, and he's much better, and, and he wouldn't think of sending anybody to hell or judging anybody now, and he really just wants to help you uh, with your business. He wants to be your co-partner in life. So take your pick. Do you want the Romans or the Greeks? Do you want the animists? Do you want the French or German philosophers? Do you want the American God? If you'll notice, whoever it is, you, you can crank, what you crank up is a, some sort of an exaggeration of human characteristics. Greed, lust, fear, murderousness. And they just project it onto their gods. And so it's no wonder that some people don't like God. If you ask them what their God is, you'll find you don't like him either. So when, we, when it comes to the true God, the Lord must reveal himself to us. And what he reveals will never be what we would have come up with. And so it takes faith, really, to understand. You have to, you have to, he has to show what he is. The Holy Spirit has to enable our minds to comprehend it. Paul says that the natural mind cannot perceive the things of the Spirit, cannot comprehend it. The human mind, uh, unaided by the Holy Spirit, cannot understand spiritual truth. Doesn't make any sense. It appears as foolishness. To the natural human mind. So when people begin to perceive the things of the spirit. You know the Holy Spirit is at work in them. Opening their understanding. What I want to look at today is not an easy subject. It's not an easy subject for me to, to preach properly. We're, gonna, we're going to look at the very heart of God. Because that's what the Ark of the Covenant represents. It is not simply some odd religious uh, object that he had them make. It has a clear purpose. There would be seven major pieces of furniture in the ark complex. I mean, in the, uh, in the tabernacle complex. Each of them has a profound spiritual lesson to teach. I don't know that I'm going to teach them all. Uh, but I did feel that I was to deal with the ark of the covenant. And I have to say, I didn't really understand much. I mean, you knew it was there and whatever. But I didn't see the clear, powerful lesson that the Lord intended to teach. He reveals his essential nature in the Ark of the Covenant, is his most essential nature. And you'll find it, it isn't the God that any of us would have invented. Now let's read the introduction to our, our uh, discussion guide. Now that Israel had entered into covenant with God, he ordered Moses to prepare a portable tent so he could travel with the nation and dwell in their midst. But the tabernacle was not to be a normal tent. God designed it down to the smallest detail, so it would teach his people essential spiritual lessons. In all, there, there would be seven major pieces of furniture, and each symbolized the truth about God. But the most important of these symbols was the Ark of the Covenant. Other objects in the complex would explain what God would do for his people and how they could draw near to him. But the ark with its mercy seat explained the very heart of God himself. Today, we'll look at this beautiful acacia wood box and the gold plate resting on top of it and listen to its message. Then, to confirm that we've interpreted these symbols correctly, we'll hear God describe himself in his own words. First to Moses, then through his son, Jesus Christ. And finally, we'll ask the question, what effect do these truths have on us personally as believers? Let's uh, start at chapter 25. I'll begin at verse 8. The Lord said to Moses, Let them, the people, construct a sanctuary for me, a dwelling place, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furniture, just so you shall construct it. So he didn't say, Moses, build me a tent, make it pretty. Sort of, he didn't give him creative license. He didn't say, uh, put up something nice. I'm gonna, I want a tent that I'm supposed to, I'll live in. He said, I want it down to the details just exactly according to the way I dictate it to you. So everything in this has 
some sort of meaning. He's done it for a reason. You shall construct an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide, and one and a half cubits high. So it's 45 inches long, almost four feet long. It is 27 inches wide, a little over two feet wide and two feet high. A simple acacia wood box. Acacia wood is a, is a desert tree with thorns that was plentiful in the wilderness. Good, hard, dark wood, real close grain stuff. Uh, and it made, it made beautiful, sturdy furniture. It says, make a box. And then you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out, you shall overlay it, and you shall make a gold molding, a little, a little rim around it, decorative rim around the top. You shall cast four gold rings for it and fasten them on its four feet. And two rings shall be on one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. So the thing has some feet, and uh, it must raise this two-foot box up to, I don't know, probably uh, maybe 40 inches or whatever, probably a counter height for us, so that the priest can access it and there'll be rings on each of those feet and you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold and you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them the poles shall remain in the rings of the ark they shall not be removed from it so interestingly if you went into the holy of holies the ark is there with these poles on either side through the rings, which were intended for the priests to carry when they, when they marched with this thing, but they left the poles in. It was always ready to move. Now you notice God is creating a mobile worship center, as it were, a mobile tent for himself. It is meant to be packed up. It is meant to go wherever his people would go. He's that kind of God. He travels in our midst. Later on, there would be a temple, but the temple wasn't his idea. He didn't even like temples. Uh, when David said, I'll build you a temple, he said, I don't want a temple. Never asked you for a temple. Why would you even say temple? I mean, it was kind of that, that kind of discussion went on uh, with David. And he finally relented and allowed them to build him a temple, but the temple doesn't re represent the heart of God. God said, I've dwelt in that tabernacle, and I'm perfectly happy, and I've asked no one. Never has one of my prophets asked you to build me a temple. He is a mobile God, and of course he could care less, I mean, in terms about does he want a temple? I mean, wow, that sure impresses God. The one who spoke the worlds into existence, you know, he's, he's going to come to say, hey, look, everybody, they built me a temple. You know, look in there, isn't that cute? I mean, as if the temple was somehow impressive to him. So for him, he says, what represents my heart is this mobile uh, uh, things everything has got a, a, a clear symbol now verse 16 is important because it tells us the purpose of this ark so far we're at this wooden box you shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you what does that refer to the ten commandments the two tablets of stone which the Lord will, has has written the ten commandments with his own finger he, he has these stones will go in the box so the ark is an ark in that it carries, it's a box meant to carry the Ten Commandments. That's what it is. So at the heart and center of, 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 of God are his Ten Commandments. His, we, people call it his law. He calls it his testimony, his witness. I, I like that better. It is, the, it is the expression of his covenant. If you're in covenant with me, this is how I want my people to live, for this is who I am. It's an expression of his very heart. When we went through the Ten Commandments, we saw that the essence of the Ten Commandments is what? Do you remember? It is the love of God, isn't it? Two areas of love. First of all, we are to love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with our soul. The first four commandments tell us how to do that. And the second six commandments tell us what? how to love our neighbors as ourselves. God had to explain love because our love isn't, isn't the real thing. Our love isn't like his love. Our love is different. And so he said, now what real love looks like is this. Real love won't lie. Real, real love won't adulterize. Real love won't steal. Real love won't murder in all of its various forms, right down to the, to the most tender attitudes within us. 
That's what real love looks like. And so he's expressing what love is. So the Ten Commandments, in my mind, are not some kind of rigid law. They are absolute values, but they are actually what love looks like. And insofar as we're uncomfortable with them, it says something about our love, not God's. <laughs> you see? So the Ten Commandments. Now, on top of this box, and always joined to it, is another article of furniture. That's what we need to see next. Beginning at verse 17. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. So there's going to be a gold plate that goes on top. It's not the lid, but it sits on top of the ark. And it's the exact same dimensions, 45 inches by 27 inches. It will go right on top of this thing. It's called a mercy seat. It's translated that here. But the word has nothing to do with a seat. Uh, it's kafar. It means that w a place of atonement. Uh, I won't go through the history of how, and I'm, but I'm going to call it the mercy seat because that's what we, we know it as. That's customarily what we call the thing. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Make them of hammered work. In other words, beautiful sculptured uh, cherubim at the two ends, the long ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other. You should make the cherubim. When it has I am in Hebrew, that's the plural. So cherubim is, is more than one cherub. You should make the cherubim of one piece with its mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. So on the two long ends of this plate, there are not simply angels. The cherubim are not, are not your run-of-the-mill day-to-day uh, angel. The cherubim are uh, all we, what we see when we see in, what it's shown us in heaven. There are four of them. Uh, there may be more because some guard the tree of life. Or it may all mean the same thing. But they are, they're a very rare angel whose sole role is to be around the throne of God himself and actually bear his throne as he has wheels on his throne. Talk about a mobile God, if you recall. It is, it, never mind. Boy, I see some faces going. <laughs> wheels on his throne. Ezekiel. Um, what is it? Chapter one in there? Or chapter, I don't know. But it, it has the wheel. It never he has wheels, okay, and I, I don't know what they, <laughs> just leave it there, move on. So he is mobile. But around him are these cherubs, and they are not just your normal um, angel. I think Isaiah sees them and calls them seraphim, which means the burning ones. Cherub means to praise or adore, very likely. And so the normal word for them is the adoring ones, the praising ones. They are worshiping angels that are around the Lord in his presence all the time. Why, you might ask, would he ask for cherubs to be placed on either end of the mercy seat? Why not a normal angel? Why not a pomegranate? Why did it have to be a cherub? I actually believe it is telling us something very important for the cherubs behold the Lord himself and notice the cherubs are spreading their wings in a great arch over this plate and they are facing one another but their faces are down at the plate beholding what's there and what will be placed there well once a year there will be blood sprinkled there atoning for the sins of the nation and asking God for mercy. I think it's telling uh, the, 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 the very cherubs are beholding the blood of their Lord prophetically being splashed there and marveling at it is what I think is uh, why they're there. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, verse 21, and in the ark you shall put the testimony, the Ten Commandments, which I shall give you, and then he says something remarkable. He says, there I will meet with you 
And from above the mercy seat and between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. So this, this uh, mercy seat will be a place where God's voice actually speaks to Moses. I doubt that he continued speaking like that to other high priests. I don't think, I mean, uh, Moses wasn't a high priest, but I don't think any of them were in the category that this would take place. But, but with Moses, he would speak to him there. So literally, Moses would, bo- would come there and would hear the voice of the Lord. Uh, remarkable. And also, it was a place where the blood would be spattered. Uh, once a year, Yom Kippur, uh, Day of Atonement. I said the cover, that mercy seat is called the Kafar, same root word, the Yom Kippur, and that blood would be splattered there. So notice what we have in this, this object or this combination of two objects, which are always one. We have the heart of God. We have his holiness and his righteousness represented in the Ten Commandments. We have on top of it a place where the blood is splattered, calling on God for forgiveness and mercy for those who sin against him. Law and grace, holiness and mercy, always together in the heart of God. You know, some people say, um, uh, Old Testament is is kind of a mean old God who seems to want to kill everybody, and New Testament is a nice God Real happy and friendly, Jesus. It's like you've got two different gods or something. That's very perverse. It's a very false notion of things. Would you notice right in the heart, talk about Old Testament, here we are in the the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, and you have the, the law and you have the grace of God all there all at once. The commandments reveal the most essential nature of God's heart, which is his love. 1 John 4 says, God is love. You couldn't say it any more directly. Now, love isn't God, but God's very most essential. If you're going to say, what is the most essential thing about God? Who is he? He is perfect love. He is perfect love. Everything he does, everything he does is an expression of his love. You and I may not understand it, but if we had his understanding and his love, we would. These commandments teach us how to love God with all our heart and our neighbor as ourselves. The reason God's law seems difficult and painful and uh, harsh to us is because our kind of love is not like his at all. Let me illustrate this um, in a, we had a program a number of years ago called Search for Significance. And one of the illustrations they used, uh, I haven't forgotten, uh, they would have a glass of water, a clear crystal glass of water. And uh, they'd say, do you everybody want to drink a water? And we're all, ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Beautiful glass of water. And then they would have a little eyedropper with some sewage in it. And they would take this thing and they would just take and drop, boink, one drop of sewage into this crystal clear glass of water and say, now who wants a drink? And nobody did, as you might imagine. You couldn't see the sewage. It had quickly dissipated into this whole glass, but you knew it was there. What had been pure was now contaminated. God's love is pure and it's crystal clear. Our love is mixed with sewage in various forms. What kind of sewage? Well, Lust, jealousy, pride, ambition, greed, fear, dishonesty, lying, impatience, cruelty, selfishness. I may have some really nice love, I mean, but it'll have a drop or two, or sometimes it's a cloudy, tur- turbid mess <laughs> of sewage in it. Let me give you an illustration. I might love my children dearly, and and my whole concern is is out of love for them, but it's mixed with fear. And I fear that they'll make the same mistakes I made when I was their age. And and so I grab a hold of those kids, and I just press and push and try to control left and right because I'm terrified. 
Not simply out of who the child is, but out of what I did. And so that fear dropped into my cup of love, contaminates it. And so now what is loving is also destructive and breaks up relationships and troubles hearts. You see that? Or you, can, you could mix in any one of these drops into the thing. Ours is mixed. His is pure. His is clean. And so we, we sometimes struggle with his, his love, but his is not mixed with any sewage at all. It's absolutely pure, which is, by the way, the best news in the world you've ever heard. Imagine we were trapped in a universe where the God was corrupt. There would be no hope ever for us. But because the God who made heaven and earth is pure and holy and loving and righteous, our eternity is wonderful. Since the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments, express the heart of God, will they ever change? Will we outgrow them? Will a million years from now it be okay to kill or to murder or to lie or to adulterize or to steal? Will it ever change? Can, can you see the struggle that our society has with unchanging what's called transcendent transcends this present realm, eternal values. And yet, the Ten Commandments aren't something God dreamed up. They reflect who God is. And so they'll never change. That fundamental character, the fundamental basis of, of, of right and wrong will never change. It isn't trendy. It doesn't move. It doesn't adjust to what people down on planet Earth think. Because he doesn't change. And I'm glad. It's been a wild ride just in my lifetime. Amen. Hasn't it? What was right 10 years ago and now is, is so wrong. Or whatever. Aren't you tired of the wild ride? The, the, the uh, unstable, quick changing, swirling values of, of right and wrong? And yet, here at the heart of God, and notice what he wrote them on, stone, with his own hand. So there's no question it was spelled right. <laughs> Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt honor thy father and mother. Now, it's not going to change. Now, the mercy seat combined with this, so we've got the law, if you want to call it that, but then right with it, you've got the mercy seat. It was a gold plate designed to see, receive the blood of a sacrifice. Though God is just and will punish sin, the Ten Commandments say he will. God says he will. This is the standards. I will punish those who sin. And yet, he is also merciful in his essential nature. And longs to give mercy to the sinner. The presence of the cherubim tell us whose blood will make that mercy possible. In heaven, the cherubim are special order of angels which stand beside the throne of God. They're beholding the Lord himself. Therefore, the truth about God is that he is holy in his perfect love. But yet, he is merciful. He has sent us his law. And that law will never change. Because it expresses his kind of love. He will justly punish those who violate his law, but he has also provided grace to forgive the sinner who repents. And the price of that grace would be his own blood. When people think about God, they often come up with one or the other. He is either a harsh judge who will hold us to some standard he wrote on some stones many millennia ago and going to send us all to hell if he gets a chance. Or they have a God over here who doesn't hold to any standards at all. He's just whooshy, gooshy love. And, uh, oh, sure, he might send Adolf Hitler and maybe Mussolini and maybe Genghis Khan. We could go down to some, some infamous lists of bad people. Uh, they might go to hell, but 
Certainly no one like us would ever go. And so you have this American society where they, most of them believe in hell and none of them believe they're going there. In fact, hell isn't really even a nice subject to talk about. Certainly it was God's come. He came up with it on a bad day. And since then he has had therapy and he's much better shaped now. And we don't even like to talk about that. And yet you know what hell is? Hell is God allowing humans to follow the leader of their choice. That's what Jesus says in John 16. He says, he says uh, the Holy Spirit has come to convict of, of, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. When he comes to judgment, he says judgment in that the, the ruler of this world has been judged. In other words, if you follow that person, you'll go and join them in their judgment. So if you want to choose the world's God, and if you want to follow that God, you will join that God in his eternity. So it's really allowing you the freedom to choose who it is you'll follow. It isn't a God. In my mind, a, God isn't at all. Not only is he not pleased to send anyone to hell, I believe he grieves over the whole thing. I think so much so that the, the Lord Jesus himself came from his throne and was crucified on our behalf saying, Doing, doing the utmost to stop this. And yet the war goes on and some people reject him and choose to follow the ruler of this world. And indeed, you'll spend eternity for your spirit. That's the problem, see? Your spirit and spirit doesn't stop. Your body will stop, though you get resurrected and I don't know what to do with that. I mean, even, the, even those who don't love the Lord will be resurrected. But you'll spend eternity with the one you follow. You follow Jesus Christ, you'll spend eternity with him. You follow the ruler of this world, you'll spend eternity with him. And the problem is the ruler of this world has been judged. <laughs> Thank heavens. I don't, can you imagine an eternity with that beast? That's, I ought to give an altar call right about now, huh? <laughs> I will say that if, you, if you're toying with your eternity, you are making a foolish choice. There is, there is no explanation for it. You say, well, oh, no, yes, there is. I have to give up this, this, and this if I follow God. Okay, big deal. You have to give up a few things to walk righteously, to have an eternity of absolute joy. And you say that's a bad trade-off? I don't think it is. I think it's the wisest choice you've ever made in your life. Yeah, there's some things we have, to get, we have to give up and we have to walk righteously with him in order to inherit eternal life. Here's how God describes himself to Moses. Turn with me a couple of chapters to uh, Exodus 34. Let's see if I got this right on these symbols. Am I just inventing this, uh, these, this sort of two, two parts of his nature, his holiness as well as his mercy, or, or is that indeed who he is? Now, remember, Moses asked the Lord, he said, I'd like to see what you look like. And, he, and he, he says, show me your glory. Remember that? Lord said, all right, but I'm going to have to put you in the crevice of a rock and cover you with my hand or I'll fricassee you like a bug. <laughs> Last night, somebody came up and said, what's fricasseeing? Isn't that where you let the flames, well, you're, it's a cooking method, and you let the flames burn the thing a little bit? Is that fricasseeing? Yeah. I'm hoping it is. Anyway, <laughs> so he says, I'm going to roast you like a bug here if I'm not careful. So I got to put you in, a, in the crevice of this rock. I'll cover you with my hand. You can't see me coming or I'll just burn you to a crisp, but I'm going to let you see me going. And as I do, I will speak my name. And he doesn't just say Yahweh as he goes by. He, ex he says more about himself as he passes by. He explains his essential nature. The very, here's what God in, in, in a, in a one minute soundbite would say about himself. That's a little bit secular to put it that way. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed. Here's what he says. The Lord, in other words, Yahweh, uh, that's, that's the Hebrew. Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious. In fact, why don't you read that with me now? Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, 
who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Stop there. So what do we have in the heart of God? Can you, could you describe mercy any more beautifully? He is compassionate. He is slow to anger. He's full of kind favor. Loving kindness is his promised love. The things he promises his covenant people, that he will keep that, those promises and bless them. He says, full of that. To a thou, it says thousands here. We know what that means. Deuteronomy repeats this, but adds generations. So in other words, forever. For your children and your children's children and your children's 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 children. Wait on down. As long as people love him, he will never stop blessing. The blessing will go on till the coming of Jesus Christ. That's what it says. So he describes himself. And what part of the, what part of the Ark of the Covenant we, did we just describe? The mercy seat. There it is. This merciful God who in his very essential nature longs to forgive, longs to wash away our sin, is slow to anger, understands our frailty. And notice it said three different kinds of sin there. Do you see that kind of strange statement? It said iniquity, transgression, and sin. See that? Those are three Hebrew words which mean different kinds of sin. The first kind is open revolt. The second kind is deception. You got, you're, you're stupid enough and got led into it. And the third kind is weakness. You just couldn't withstand the temptation. He says, I forgive it all. I forgive open revolt. I forgive deception. I forgive, I forgive even the weaknesses of your flesh. Now he goes on. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. He says, I, in my righteousness, in my holiness, I will punish sin. And you say, what's this about kids? What that statement means is three and four generations is how many people can be alive at one moment. Grand, great grandparents down to the youngest grandchild. What he says is, my love and my mercy should not be construed to mean that I will not, if you hate me, and if the whole society hates me, that I will not come and sweep that society away from the youngest to the oldest. And indeed, he did that with Israel. In 721, the Assyrians came and took the entire 10 northern tribes, just wiped them out. Later on, 586 BC, the Babylonians came and they took Judah and they took them into exile for 70 years, the entire society, men, young, young and old, from the, from the greatest grandfather to the youngest baby, swept them and took them away into other lands. He did exactly what he said he would do. He says, don't construe my mercy. That those, and he tells it in Deuteronomy who it is, of those who hate me, those who have set themselves against me and do not want to know my ways. So we have a God who is compassionate and who is just. Does Jesus say this kind of thing? Let's get to the New Testament where we have the nice God and, and, and see if things have changed. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 17, surely Jesus, would not say anything like that. That was him saying it in the first place, folks. Do not think that I came to abolish the law. Verse 17 in Matthew 5. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, unless heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Does he sound like he's backing off? 
He's saying, he's saying, don't construe anything I've said to undermine the basic morality of God. Nothing has changed. In fact, my followers will have greater sense of morality and, and, and express love more purely than those of the old covenant. He says, nothing's changed. But then let's go to chapter 9, about a few chapters to the right, and listen to his heart again. I've got lots of places I could turn. I mean, these are huge rivers running through the Bible, these themes. 9, verse 11. The Pharisees are upset with him because he keeps eating with tax collectors and sinners. Whoa. And when Jesus heard this, verse 12, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this is, means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now what are we seeing? The mercy seat. There he is. Yes, he says, now don't assume for a moment that I've ever undermined the morality, the basic holiness and the purity of the standards of God, and nothing's to change. And yet, what's my heart? My heart is to eat with tax collectors and sinners, with prostitutes and with thieves and with, with the leprous and the sick. I love people, he says. I've come to save people, not damn them. My heart is to win the lost. I don't care what you've done. Come to me, and I'll forgive you and wash you. That's always the heart of God. This great, loving, calling, inviting heart of God, and yet not compromising his standard. Not loving because he's a, he's a gushy fool, but loving because he is so perfect, so holy. And the call, people, is not simply for us to be able to sin on and continue to be unholy while we're forgiven. But the call is for us to have the same heart. Let's see that last point. What has he got planned for you and me? We are, first of all, to love like he loves. Why don't we say that together? We are to love like he loves. Jesus said in John 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Now that, would, that is an awesome statement. Secondly, read that out loud with me. We are to be holy as he is holy. Christianity does not mean I can do anything I want and I'm forgiven for it. Christianity means that I have the heart of God. I long to be holy. I understand his standards and I want them in my life. In fact, Paul says that God from the foundations of the earth predestined that there would be a race of people who were true children of his son. Spiritually, they were like his son. We have been foreordained to be conformed to the image of his beloved son. You indeed, the day, you're in process now, and the day will come when you're going to be just like Jesus. Is that good news? And the, the process has started now. Not someday will he hit you with a magic wand. I mean, he, he will. I think we'll get kind of, he must pick up the slack at the end. Huh? And yet, the process has started now. It started now. Hallelujah. Peter says this, but, be, be like, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And so the heart of a Christian is like the heart of God. Merciful, gracious, kind, longing, not judging people, but longing to see them saved. And yet not compromising God's standard, knowing his holiness, knowing his purity, knowing his values. We hold the two in tension in our heart, even as God's heart. We are to be merciful as he's been merciful to us. Paul says in Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. We're to treat each other with that same kind of grace. Well, would you have ever invented a God like this? A God who is both holy and pure and will not compromise his standard at all? A God who will indeed finally punish those who hate him? 
But a God who doesn't want to because of his great love and is doing everything in his power to save and rescue and forgive the sinner. When you think about it, I wouldn't want any other God. I don't want a God who, who's unclean and impure and doesn't care. It does matter when murders happen and lies are told, when adulteries take place. It matters a great deal. They're horrible things. I would want him to hate them. And I'm glad he does. And the more I'm with him, the more I do. Just, I hate what sin does to people. I hate the terrible things that are destroyed and the, the relationships that are broken and the damage that comes from sin, don't you? Doesn't, doesn't your heart, in fact, so, th Thursday night at the prayer meeting, Lord just took a while where he ministered because as people's hearts are getting more and more loving, they're getting more and more hurt. <laughs> I mean, people are coming in with just these, ah, oh, as you see the horror of, of what people do to each other, it just makes you sick inside. That's how God feels. He doesn't change his standards. But that same love of his that's so holy brings him to long and say, and I will do everything in my power to save you. I'm, I love you. And all he wants from us is loyalty. He wants us to love him and to repent and to honor him and come back to him over and over quickly when we sin. I couldn't think of a more lovely God. I couldn't think of a more lovely combination of holiness and grace, of his, of his purity and yet his mercy, all in the heart of God. We never would have come up with a God like this. He had to explain it to us so many times. For us to see his heart. Heavenly Father. We worship the true God today. We come with. With. A healthy and a right fear of you. You are a holy and a pure Lord. At your very heart. Your ten commandments express who you are. And they will never change. Lord you said that's the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom understanding that you indeed are a God who will judge the permanently rebellious. Thank you. Thank you that you will not change. But Lord, you're also a loving, longing, seeking, searching God who has paid the ultimate price to save your creation who's come after us and allowed us to do things to you that are unspeakable so that we could be with you. Such love we'll never understand. Grace us as a people to walk in the fear of God. Grace us, Lord, to learn to walk in your holiness, not to indulge or, or be indifferent to unhealthy things in our lives, to wrong attitudes, to lovelessness. But Lord, when we do sin and as you convict and grieve us, we will run into your arms, not away from you, not afraid of you, but knowing your loving heart, we will run into your arms to the throne of grace where we will find mercy and help in time of need. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. We worship you, Father. You are holy and lovely. You are righteous and pure. In these last days, you have revealed yourself through your blessed Son, Jesus. And in, in him, we find the same thing. An uncompromising purity and a holiness. And a compassion and a kindness beyond words. We honor the true God. And we would be sons and daughters of yours. We would have your heart in us. Grace us with holiness. Fill us with mercy and love. That we might be your children indeed. In Jesus' name we ask it.